Welcome back guys, I want to welcome you guys back to another episode of Med School Mondays with uh, Promo, there's my protege, Promo or uh, actually that's Promo and I'm his protege, okay whatever, let's get right to it. Today we're going to talk about a condition called Syndrome of Inappropriate ADH Secretion. Now if you were with us last week on last week Monday's uh, video, we talked about diabetes insipidus. So in case you missed last week's lecture, I highly highly recommend that you click the link below and uh, catch up with that lecture for sure. So today, like we said, we're going to talk about syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Just like the name sounds, way too much ADH is being secreted. Let's uh, direct our attention over here for a quick second. Antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, is produced in the supraoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus. It is brought to the posterior pituitary gland by these specialized channels referred to as the neurofesins. It is stored in the posterior pituitary gland until it gets a signal to actually release it. So what is that signal? The signal is an increase in serum osmolality levels. Okay? Take a look down over here at this table for a quick, quick second. The lab values indicate over here the normal serum osmolality levels for uh, the body is between 250 to 290 milliosmoles per kilogram. The normal urine osmolality levels is anywhere above the level of 800 milliosmoles per kilogram. So what are we saying? We're saying when the normal serum values, when the values have increased a, a lot more than normally, that's when the posterior pituitary gland gets a signal to release the ADH. ADH, once it's released, is going to go right to the nephrons. It's going to work on two portions of the nephrons, the distal convoluted tubule as well as the collecting ducts. Now in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts, they work on the principal cells via these V2 receptors and adenocyclic cyclic AMP mechanism. So make sure you know all of these fine nitty gritty details as well for all of your examples. So what happens like we drew over here with this uh, purple arrow, water retention occurs. So water retention occurs and now the body is able to uh, bring their serum osmolality levels back to the normal range. Well that's perfect. But now we've got a condition called syndrome of inappropriate ADA secretion too much ADH being secreted. So if too much ADH is being secreted, well guess what? You know, you're not just getting a little bit of water retention, you're getting lots and lots of water retention. How is that gonna affect the lab values? We'll take a look down over here. The serum osmolality levels will be extremely, extremely low. So when we have extremely, extremely low serum osmolality levels, we get a condition called hyponatremia. Well, what happens to the urine osmolality levels? The urine osmolality levels increase. That is referred to as concentrated urine. So the patient is going to present with low serum osmolality levels reflected by hyponatremia and high urine osmolality levels reflected by concentrated urine. Okay? Well, the next concept is, uh, let's start thinking about the symptoms a little bit more. So we have these symptoms illustrated over here. The first concept, like we already told you, we're retaining lots and lots of water. The lots of water retention we're causing, we're causing hyponatremia. So those are sort of the two main uh, things you gotta start to think about and consider. Well, the first one is, we got lots and lot of water retention. With all this water retention, do we get edema? Well, the answer is no. So what's going on? The body recognizes that there's a lot of water in the body right now. So it promotes a scenario called natriuresis. That's the elimination and the excretion of sodium. The excretion of sodium causes elimination of water, which maintains normal water levels. How does the body do that? Three different mechanisms. The first one is it stimulates a protein called ANP. ANP stands for atrial natriuretic peptide. Okay? Second thing. At the level of the PCT, so the proximal convoluted tubule of the nephron, it's going to inhibit the sodium reabsorption. So again, we lose more sodium, water follows out as well. Okay? And the third thing, this uh, abbreviated rare RAA, so it's inhibiting the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Again, inhibiting the reabsorption of sodium, meaning we lose more sodium, meaning we lose water as well. So that's how the body actually maintains a euvolemic, a normal volume condition. Although all this water is being retained, it does its best to get flush out of the water as well. Despite the fact that the body is still dealing with hyponatremia. Okay? So second concept, hyponatremia. Well, what are the effects of hyponatremia? 
You know, you gotta also remember that not all of your uh, patients will present with symptoms of hyponatremia. So we're trying to illustrate over here that it's a spectrum. We, we have patients that are gonna be asymptomatic. We're gonna have patients with uh, presenting with mild symptoms. And if very severe, then we have uh, patients presenting with some of the more severe conditions. So of course, the mild symptoms over here show that uh, the patient may present with some weakness and some lethargy. As it gets more and more severe, uh, it gets more and more dangerous. The patient may present with a uh, cerebral edema, perhaps a seizure, uh, leading to a coma and eventual death. So that's why we definitely, definitely, definitely need to focus and decide, do we treat the patient with hyponatremia or do we not? Again, based off of symptoms and uh, based off of uh, levels as well, which we'll see in a quick second. So now let's talk about the uh, causes of SIADH. So like over here, we illustrated uh, four or five different categories. Let's start with the first category over here, insults to the brain. So insults to the brain, insults to the head, we're definitely thinking of head trauma. Another thing that could happen in the brain we know is infections. Uh, you wanna also think about CNS disorders and think about ischemic causes such as strokes, okay? The second thing over here we have is stress. Now this is extreme stress. Uh, stress followed uh, you know, after a procedure or an operation. So we call that post-op stress. Stress during the time when a patient is getting uh, anesthesia. So stress during anesthesia and stress after procedures, okay? The third thing over here we have is lung diseases. Lung diseases and infections. So that includes things like uh, tuberculosis as well as pneumonia. Both of these conditions can cause an increase in ADH. The fourth one over here, you're gonna keep seeing this in uh, all of your uh, board exams and uh, test questions in school, ectopic production of ADH. So one specific cancer of the lungs, referred to as the small cell lung cancer, causes an increase in ADH. Now what does ectopic mean? Ectopic means a production of, some, of a peptide or a hormone where it normally shouldn't happen. So this is the lungs. The lungs are producing way too much ADH. Okay, the cancer of the lungs is producing too much ADH. Now just on the side, we're gonna see this in the future lectures anyways, but the small cell lung cancer also produces a ectopic production of ACTH, adrenocorticotropic peptide hormone. Another thing that it does, small cell lung cancer, it produces these antibodies towards the presynaptic calcium channels at the neuromuscular junction, resulting in a condition you guys all know as Lambert-Eaton syndrome. Okay, so we'll see that again in future lectures. Let's get back to this. The fifth category over here is medications. So definitely you wanna know some of these medications. The first medication, the, the class of medications being sulfonylureas are used to treat diabetes mellitus, which we'll see in a future endocrine lecture. The second group of medications you want to remember are the SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They are uh, used to treat depression, uh, anxiety related disorders, as well as uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And the third one is cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide is a medication used in uh, chemotherapy, used to suppress the immune system. So you guys definitely have to know the causes for SIADH. Next is the treatment. For all of these treatments, always, always, always remember, treat the underlying cause first, okay? Well, what else can you do? You've, you're treating the underlying cause, but of course you gotta make your patient feel better, right? So these patients, unlike in diabetes insipidus, with diabetes insipidus, you know, just think back for a second. We encourage water. You have to continue giving water. But with SIADH, you restrict fluids. So don't give them those extra fluids, okay? Now, if a patient is dealing with a chronic SIADH, so a long-term uh, condition, you use this medication over here, the meclocycline. The meclocycline, now we talked about it in our last lecture as well. The meclocycline is a blocker. It blocks antidiuretic hormone receptors at the level of the nephrons. So it's a receptor antagonist. So of course, it sounds like it's gonna help it, but just be remind yourself, remind, remind, remind yourself. A side effect of the meclocycline is it's gonna cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus because it's nephrotoxic. So make sure you make that connection, okay? Another thing you wanna know about the meclocycline, it actually belongs to the tetracycline antibiotic family. So some other side effects you might wanna look out for is, you know, uh, tooth discoloration, look out for uh, bone abnormalities, and since it's a tetracycline, remember, avoid in pregnancy. Good. The third, uh, the third option for treatment is, okay, well, it, let's just say instead of a chronic SIADH, you're dealing with acute SIADH, so more of an emergency situation. Again, you can use these uh, ADH receptor blockers. These are referred to as Tolvaptin and Conivaptin. Okay, so two more medications to add to your list of uh, things to memorize, okay? 
Now the last concept again, uh, you know, depending on what, uh, where you are in your medical studies, you're going to be tested at it uh, maybe not so early on, but maybe a little bit later on. You see what I'm saying? So you want to keep in mind this concept of hyponatremia. We said there's going to be many, many different effects of hyponatremia. Well, when to treat it is the question. Of course, when you have the, the severe symptoms, you know you definitely got to treat, but how do we tell when we have severe symptoms? We look for this value as well. If the value for sodium levels is below 110 milli equivalents per liter, you want to consider treatment. And your treatment consists of IV hypertonic saline. Okay, so keep that in mind. Let me just scoot over to this side so you can read it better. So with this, it's very, very important that when you infuse hypertonic saline, you give it at a very steady and slow rate of 0.5 milli equivalents per liter per hour, not any faster. Because if you go any faster, you may induce a serious, serious condition known as cerebral pontine myelinosis, also known as osmotic demyelination syndrome. Okay, now we want to do a quick recap. We want to make sure you guys got all of the points down. Again, remind yourselves where ADH produced is produced in the supraoptic nucleus, brought to the posterior pituitary gland via these specialized channels. You know them already. Where did it work on the nephron? You know it's the DCT, the distal convoluted tubule, as well as the collecting ducts. Know all the nitty gritty details over here, listed over here. You want to keep the lab values in mind. You want to make sure you know what the normals are. And then you can actually understand why SADH causes extreme, extreme low levels of uh, serum osmolality and extreme levels of high urine osmolality levels. Okay, so keep that in mind. We come down over here. Don't get confused with this whole water retention thing. Just remind yourselves that in fact, it does not cause edema because the body promotes natriuresis through these three mechanisms. Okay, stimulates ANP, inhibits the sodium reabsorption at the PCT of the nephron, and thirdly, inhibits the renin and angiotensin aldosterone system. Okay. Concept number two, effects of hyponatremia. Definitely remember this number over here, less than 110 will cause severe, uh, some of the severe symptoms, but uh, patients may be asymptomatic. They may have mild symptoms such as weakness and lethargy. And of course the severe symptoms are quite detrimental, anywhere ranging from a cerebral edema to seizures to coma and death, okay? Remind yourself of the causes for SIADH. We said insults to the brain, so think about stuff that's going on in the brain, strokes, infections, uh, CNS disorders. You move down to the stress. The stress we're talking about post-operative stress, as well as uh, you know times of uh, when you administer anesthesia. Third thing is lung disease and infections. We know those already. TB and pneumonia. Good. Ectopic production. Remember small cell lung cancer. And medications. Three different categories: primary sulfonylureas, cyclophosphamide, and the third one was your SSRIs. Awesome. We talked about the treatment. Don't forget the underlying uh, cause. Restrict fluids for chronic SIADH, specialized tetracycline known as demiclocycline. Make sure you know the nephrotoxicity of demiclocycline. The next thing is acute, for acute SIADH, you can use these medications right here, tovaptin, conivaptin, and of course the whole concept of when do you treat hyponatremia. Definitely know this number over here, less than 110 mil equivalents per liter. And how do you treat it? IV hypertonic saline at a rate of 0.5 mil equivalents per liter per hour. Boom. That's it guys, that's it. You guys know SIADH, you guys are gonna be masters of this. You guys are gonna answer every single test question correctly. So what are we gonna do next week? Well, on next week's uh, Med School Mondays with uh, promo, we're gonna talk about growth hormone. We're gonna talk about the implications of uh, too much growth hormone as well as when we don't have enough growth hormone. So thank you very much guys. I wanna thank you guys for joining me today. I want you guys to like, subscribe, definitely share the video with all your friends and uh, we'll see you again next week on Med School Mondays with promo.